Hey, Riverdale, we're about to launch into our study on the book of Job. However, before we get too far, I just have a few instructions I want to give you. When the teaching time is over, we've included some follow-up questions for you to answer. If you're watching this with your family, you can answer these all together. If it's just you, um, you can answer these on your own. But please take the time to really think about these questions and, and answer them honestly. And then when that's done, you can, uh, I invite you to just spend a few moments closing out your time in prayer. We've included a few pointers that will help uh, guide and, and direct your prayer time. So please feel free uh, to do that when the teaching is over. With that said, I invite you to get your Bibles and let's get into the study of Job. All right, well, it's good to be back with you guys in our study on the book of Job. And so we're going to be in chapter 38 uh, tonight, Job chapter 38. And in this chapter, God uh, speaks up uh, for the first time since chapter 2. Uh, in between chapters 2 and 38, uh, we've, we've heard from Job, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, and Elihu. And let me just say this, Job has had the most to say because of how badly he was suffering. And Job has repeatedly asked God to explain himself. God, I, I just can't understand why you would treat me, an innocent man, as if I was a horrible sinner. I've done nothing to deserve this, and yet I'm suffering worse than anybody I know. Why? God, how, how could you treat Treat a saint like a sinner. Explain yourself. And, and, and guys, God did not explain himself. Uh, I, I mentioned last week that God offers no explanation because God owes no expl explanation. And the longer God remained silent, the more Job complained. And, and, and he accused God of not caring. Uh, Job accused God of being unfair. And so this went on for 36 chapters. Job went back and forth with his friends. Uh, his friends accused uh, him of being in sin. Uh, Job accused God of being unjust. And, and last week we saw in chapter 38 how out of the whirlwind God answered Job. While Job and his friends may have been uh, full of hot air, while they may have been windbags, God was a whirlwind. And, and when he speaks, everyone is silent, including Job. Even though Job said earlier that if God were to show up, Right? Job said, God, show yourself because I have so much to say. Well, God shows up, and, and instead of Job questioning God, God questions Job. And uh, how much does Job have to say? Zero. From chapters 38 through 41, God asks Job over 70 questions. Questions about who rules and regulates the planet, stars, clouds, oceans, rivers, lakes, snow, ice, thunder, lightning. Who, who controls and commands inanimate nature and who controls and commands animate nature? The birds, the beasts, the bugs. And Job, how much control, here's what God wants to know. Job, how much control do you have over those things? And Job, who thought he'd have all these things to say to God, when God questions Job, again, how, how many answers does Job have? Zero. And so the moral is, and, and guys, this is for all of us, not just Job, all right? The moral is, if no human being can control creation, then how dare any human being condemn the Creator? See, God is in the process of reminding Job that, first of all, he is big and Job is small, right? Big God, small me. And secondly, God is assuring Job, I got everything in creation under control. It's being cared for. So, Job, for you to say about me that I don't care, you're wrong, Job. You're bitter and you're angry. And, and guys, God is helping Job um, to work through all of this, okay? And last week... If you remember last week, we looked at God's control over inanimate nature. This week, we're going to see just, just how much God controls and cares for the animal kingdom, animate nature. In, in chapter 38, starting in verse 39 and, and going all the way through chapter 40, um, God uh, points uh, Job to 10 animals, um, uh, six beasts, all right, 10 animals, six beasts would be the lion, the goat, the doe, the donkey, the ox, and the horse, six beasts, and four birds, the raven, 
the ostrich, the hawk, and uh, the eagle. And it's interesting. Um, God begins with uh, with the king of the jungle, the lion, and God is going to end with the king of the sky, which is the eagle. And and guys, we're going to see. I love this. We're going to see that the that the king of the jungle and the king of the sky they both answer to and serve the king of kings, who is God Almighty. Okay, so so God is going to challenge Job with this thought. Job, do you know how the birds and the beasts live? Job, do you know exactly what they need? Do you know exactly how they function? Do you know exactly how to care for each one of them? Now, guys, in, in the Genesis account of creation, we're told that God gave mankind dominion over the birds of the air and the beasts of the fields and the, the fish in the sea. But on his own, man cannot control them, command them, or care for them. That's God's job. In his wisdom and power, God rules the whole universe and he provides what his creatures need to survive. Uh, Psalm 145, 16 says, You, O Lord, open your hand and you satisfy the desires of every living thing. And you know, guys, you and I have a hard enough time uh, taking care of ourselves and our families, but God takes care of the whole universe. God rules and runs the whole thing with precision, and we're going to be reminded of that this evening. Okay, so let's get into it. Look at chapter 38, verse 39. This is where we left off last time. Job chapter 38, starting in verse 39. God asked Job, Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their thicket? In other words, Job, do you know how to feed the lions? Job, are you able to hunt down their prey, make the kill, and give them their food? Guys, Job didn't even have to answer that. For his own safety, Job stayed far away from the lion. Look at verse 41. God asked Job, who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God for help and wander about for lack of food? You know, ravens, along with ostriches, um, this is a bird that is known for being a bad parent. Uh, ravens often neglect their young, and so when, when, when the baby ravens are left to fend for themselves, would Job know what to do? Does Job know when they're hungry? Would Job be able to get them food? Those neglected young ravens have the instincts to wander around feeding off the carcasses left behind by the lions. Who gave the ravens those instincts? Not Job. God did it. Job is not the creator or the caretaker of the ravens. Only God is. I love this verse in, in Luke chapter 12. It's verse 24. J just listen to this. Jesus is speaking to his followers, and he says, Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse or barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? Guys, the ravens don't need to plant or harvest. They don't need to stockpile food in barns. Why? Because God feeds them. And since God made us above the ravens, won't he also take care of us? I like how the New Living Translation wraps up Luke, 20, Luke 12, 24. It says, you are far more valuable to God than any birds. Job, you accuse me of not caring. Well, look at the lions. Look at the ravens. I feed them. I care for them. But I'm going to neglect you? No way. No way. God moves on from the lions and ravens to talk about the goats and deer. Look at chapter 39, chapter 39, verse 1. God asked Job, do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Guys, um, how helpful is Job to the mountain goats when they give birth? Job's not even there. See, mountain goats don't give birth under Job's supervision, but God's. Uh, there are these mountain goats in the Middle East. I'm, I'm probably going to butcher their name. They're called the Nubian Ibex. The Nubian Ibex. And these goats go into hiding when they give birth. Very few people have ever seen these goats when that is happening, but God sees. God knows. It all happens under his watchful eye and careful supervision. 
Back to verse 1. Job, do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the does? Can you number the months that they fulfill? And do you know the time when they give birth, when they crouch, bring forth their offspring, and are delivered of their young? Job, are you aware every time a doe has a fawn? Do do you know about it? Are are you there? You know, every other year, my family and I uh, will go to this resort in Virginia. It's it's up in the mountains, and the deer are protected uh, in this resort. And 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 guys, there are thousands of deer at this place, mostly does and their fawns. And it's incredible to think that God is acutely aware and is carefully overseeing every doe giving birth to every fawn. Job can't do that. I can't do that. Look at verse 4. God says the, the, the doze young ones become strong. They grow up in the open. They go out and do not return to them. Job, are you aware of when each fawn grows up? Do, do you know how the fawn grows and how its mother knows when her fawn is ready to leave home and, and fend for itself? Again, every time I, I go to this resort in Virginia... I'll see a doe with her babies, and then I come back two years later, and and I wonder how many of those babies are now does or bucks and have started families of their own. Can, Can I answer that question? No. Can God? Yes, because he supervises the whole thing. It's really incredible. Look at verse 5. God asked Job, uh, who has let the wild donkey go free? Who has loosed the bonds of the swift donkey to whom I have given the arid plain for his home and the salt land for his dwelling place? He scorns the tumult of the city. He hears not the shouts of the driver. He ranges the mountains as his pasture, and he searches after every green thing. Guys, the, the wild donkey, um, this animal refuses to be domesticated. Right? The, the wild donkey refuses man's authority. It has rejected the noise of civilization. That's what verse 7 means when it says that the donkey scorns the tumult of the city. He hears not the shouts of the driver. The donkey rejects the noise of civilization to run wild in the wilderness. Well, guys, how does the wild donkey survive without our help? God takes care of it. God taught the wild donkey how to care for itself. Neither Job nor I nor you, none of us play any role in their survival, and yet they still survive. Why? How? Again, God does it. God does it. Look at verse 9. God introduces Job to the wild ox. Verse 9, I'll I'll read through verse 12. God says to Job, is the wild ox willing to serve you? Will he spend the night at your manger? Can you bind him in the furrow with ropes? Or will he harrow the valleys after you? Will you depend on him because his strength is great? And will you leave to him your labor? Do you have faith in him that he will return your grain and gather to your threshing floor? Job, you you can't even tame a wild ox. Guys, like the donkey, the wild ox resists authority. So go ahead, Job, and try to keep a wild ox in your barn. Try to harness him to your plow. Try to force him to do your harvesting. It's not going to work. Guys, we've all heard the expression, strong as an ox. An ox is known for its strength, but a wild ox will not serve man. A wild ox will not do any heavy lifting for man. Job, it won't do your plowing. It won't pull your cart. Here's what God is getting at. Job, if you can't even control a single wild ox, then why in the world are you trying to confront me, the creator of the universe? Look at verse 13. Uh, God shows Job the ostrich, which guys, let let me just say this. Ostriches, honestly, they freak me out. They freak me out. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if you feel the same way here, but, but one of my worst nightmares would be to be chased by an ostrich. Again, those things, those things freak me out, partly because they are bizarre, weird-looking birds. They're huge. They can weigh over 300 pounds. They can get to over nine feet tall, and they got those little heads and long necks and pointy beaks and massive wings. And, and check this, they can run up to 60 miles per hour. 
It's a frightening bird, and, and so now I'm going to talk about them. Verse 13, God says, The wings of the ostrich wave proudly, but are they the pinions and plumage of love? In other words, ostriches can flap their huge wings, but they can't fly. All the ostrich can do with its wings is fan the air while chasing you down at 60 miles an hour. Look at verses 14 and 15. For she leaves her eggs to the earth and lets them be warmed on the ground, forgetting that a foot may crush them and that the wild beast may trample them. So ostriches make their nests on the ground and that's where they lay their eggs. In studying for this lesson, I learned that several ostriches will lay their eggs in one nest, and if there's no more room in the nest, they'll just lay their eggs right in the sand beside the nest. And, and what happens is when, when other ostriches step in and out of the nest, sometimes they crush the eggs that are laying on the ground, laying in the sand. So not the smartest of birds, which is a, another thing that freaks me out. These birds are unpredictable. You, you don't know what they're going to do. Look at verses 16 and 17. She, the ostrich, deals cruelly with her young, as if they were not hers, though her labor be in vain, yet she has no fear, because God has made her forget wisdom and given her no share in her understanding. So uh, like the raven, uh, the ostrich is a bad parent. She doesn't really care for its young. An ostrich may at any given time desert its nest. Sometimes they'll abandon their nest before their eggs have hatched. If they sense a predator is near, the ostrich will trample its own eggs. And so if they're that way with their own young, well, how are they going to be with me? See, that's why I don't like them. I don't trust them. Again, and, and again, guys, uh, forget running away from them. Forget running away from them. Look at verse 18. When the ostrich rouses herself to flee, she laughs at the horse and his rider. Again, these birds are fast. Believe it or not, they're faster than a horse. Uh, you know, a horse can top out at, at around 55 miles per hour. Again, ostriches can reach 60 miles per hour. And if they trample their own young, well, they have, they have no problem running me over. So guys, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask the Lord, why ostriches? Like, like, why create those things? Guys, I have no idea why. Neither does Job. And that's God's whole point. See, God brings up the ostrich's weird anatomy and odd behavior. And, and God's like, Job, since you're so smart, explain the ostrich. Explain why I would make a bird that can't fly but can run faster than a horse. Explain why I would make a bird that builds her nest on the ground where predators can eat their eggs and trample them. Explain why I would make a bird that seems unconcerned for its young. Job, if you can't figure the ostrich out, what makes you think you got me figured out? Job, you're, you're sure that I don't care. You're sure that I'm so unjust. You know very little, Job. Very little. Look at verse 19. God brings up the horse. In stark contrast to the ostrich, the horse is truly one of the most beautiful animals on the planet. It's really hard to argue against that. Horses are admired for their raw power, their brute strength, their courage. Look at verse 19, and uh, I'll, I'll read through verse 25. God says to Job, do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with a mane? Do you make him leap like the locust? His majestic snorting is terrifying. He paws in the valley and exults in his strength. He goes out to meet the weapons. He laughs at fear and is not dismayed. He does not turn back from the sword. Upon him rattle the quiver, the flashing spear, and the javelin. With fierceness and rage, he swallows the ground. He cannot stand still at the sound of the trumpet. When the trumpet sounds, he says, Aha! He smells the battle from afar, the thunder of the captains in the shouting. So God is describing for Job a war horse. So this is not a horse you'd find on a farm. This is a horse that belongs on the battlefield. I love how John Walverd describes um, the verses we just read. I want you to listen to this. 
He says, did Job have anything to do with creating the war horse with its strength and mane, its ability to leap like a locust while snorting in the air and pawing at the ground eagerly, fearlessly entering battle? His rider's weapons are on his side. He prances the ground as if eating it up. He waits for the trumpet blast to signal the charge. Snorting, he smells the scent of battle from a distance and hears the battle commands. Warren Wearsby says you can almost visualize the war horse prancing and pawing, eager to rush into battle. When he hears the trumpet, he can't stand still, but runs so fast that he seems to be eating up the ground. It was God, not Job, who made the war horse with the strength and ability it needed to face danger and serve effectively on the field of battle. Guys, I just let me just ask you, how does Job... How does Job measure up to the war horse's strength and power? How do we measure up? See, we all fall short. And since we all fall short of the horse's strength, then how much more do we fall short of God's strength? Big God, small me. John MacArthur says Job must have been feeling less and less significant under the crushing indictment of such comparisons with God. Guys, how could you not feel less and less significant? But God's not done. He moves on from the horse to highlight the hawk. Look at verse 26. God asked Job, is it by your understanding that the hawk soars and spreads his wings towards the south? So God wants to know if Job has anything to do with the hawk's annual migration. Job, did you give the hawk its instinct to fly south? Do you tell the hawk when, where to migrate? Look at verse 27. Verses 27 and 28, God says to Job, Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? On the rocks he dwells and makes his home on the rocky crag in stronghold. The, the, the eagle... Um, builds his nest uh, at high altitudes. Right? That's what the eagle does. He, he builds his nest on top of mountains. And, 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 and so God is saying, Job, did, did you put that in the eagle's mind? Did you influence the eagle to make its home on top of a mountain? Do you have any control over that? Look at verse 29. From there, from the mountaintop, the eagle spies out the prey. His eyes behold it from, a, from far away. His young ones suck up blood, and where the slain are, there is he. So Job, since you, since you didn't command the eagles to build their nests on the cliffs, well then maybe, maybe, Job, you gave the eagles good eyesight to be able to see their prey from those cliffs. Did you do that, Job? Did you give the eagle its eyesight? Guys, God told the eagle when and where to build his nest. God gave the eagle its eyesight to see its prey from far away. God gave the eagle its wings to be able to swoop down from above. God gave the eagle its talons to snatch his prey and bring it back to its young. God made them that way. You know, Psalm chapter 19, Psalm chapter 19, verse 1. That verse is so true. It says that the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens or the universe declares the glory of God. The, the word glory in Psalm 19.1 means evidence. You see, the universe, both the inanimate universe, the sun, the, the stars, the sky, the solar system, both the inanimate universe and the animate universe, again, the birds, the beasts, and the bugs, with the way each one was uniquely made, with the way each one uniquely functions, they all provide evidence that there is a God. And this God who created the universe controls the universe. And this God who controls the universe commands the universe. God both rules and regulates his creation. God commands the sun when to rise and when to set. God commands the oceans when to roar and when to be still. God commands the clouds when to send rain and when to send snow. God commands the lakes when to freeze and when to thaw. God commands the earth to turn and the winds to blow and the seasons to change. Guys, God is in control of the animal world. 
He gives the lions and ravens their food. He gives the goats and the deer their young. He makes the donkey and ox go free. He made the ostrich weird and the horse strong. He created the hawk and the eagle to fly and hunt. God's creation is orderly. It's it's provided for. It's well cared for. And if that's what God does for the raven and for the ostrich and for the donkey, then won't he provide for you? Won't he see that you're well cared for? See, God is reminding Job and us that just as much as he is in control of what the lions eat and when the doe gives birth and where the mountain goats roam and how the eagles hunt and why the ostrich is so bizarre, God is equally, precisely, completely in control of my life and your life. God controls the what, when, where, how and why. Guys, it's such a it's such a comfort to know that not only does God control his creation, not only does God command his creation, but God also cares for his creation. It's such a comfort to know that not only did God plan his creation, not only did God produce his creation, but God also provides for his creation. And and next week, Lord willing, we're going to see even more clearly God's greatness demonstrated in his control over animate nature. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word once again. Um, It reveals to us who you are. And God, we've learned uh, in Job 38 and Job 39, God, we've seen just how much you care for even the ravens even the birds. You see them, you know them, you you are aware of what they need and you provide what they need. And God, if you care for the birds that way, how much more do you care for us? God, you see us, you know us, you're aware of what we need. You provide what we need. You are ruling and regulating all things. You are controlling and commanding all things. And not only do you control and command all things, God, but you care. You care so deeply for what you have created, for who you have created. And so, God, thank you for that. Thank you for watching over us. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your protection. Forgive us for when we doubt that. And God, thank you for being so faithful, so consistent in your care and your provision, even though we doubt you. God, you are so good. We are so undeserving of your grace. And yet it's new to us every morning. Thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.